So good afternoon, everyone. You are all very welcome to this webinar, Commercialize Your Research Your Way. My name is Liam Fitzgerald, Business Incubation Manager in the Science Foundation Ireland Marai Centre. This is the National Centre for Research and Innovation across the areas of energy, climate and marine, comprising 13 Irish academic institutions, over 200 research researchers, and 75 industry partners. I'm also the National Marine Incubation Manager, kindly supported by Enterprise Ireland. I'm delighted to say we have almost 500 people registered for our webinar today, representing third level institutions and research organisations all across Ireland and beyond. You will hear from four speakers over the next hour or so. Rich Ferry, Director of UCC Innovation, will introduce examples of the types of knowledge transfer supports available across all Irish third level institutions to bring technologies from bench to boardroom. Claire Walsh from Enterprise Ireland will talk about taking your research out of the lab and into the marketplace, utilising supports like the Enterprise Ireland Commercial Feasibility Fund and the Commercialisation Fund. Kevin Burke will present the Enterprise Ireland Business Partners Programme and explore how this might work for you in bringing commercial expertise to your spin out. And finally, our special guest is Fiona Edwards Murphy, co-founder and CEO of Apis Protect, one of the most exciting technology startups in Ireland right now, who will talk to us about her journey from researcher to successful entrepreneur. We have a full schedule and a large audience online. So to answer as many questions as we can while we progress through the session, can I ask you to use the Q&A function on the top right of your screens? Tara now is going to put up a, a, um, a slide for this. Type in your questions as they occur to you and our speakers will respond uh, to as many as possible as we progress through. Don't worry if your questions don't immediately appear on screen when at, once asked. Presenters need to publish the questions on their end before they become visible to you. Any questions we fail to address today, we will attempt to answer these and email responses to you after the event. Speaker email addresses will appear during the session and will appear on a slide at the end of the session if you want to contact people directly. And a video recording of this session will also be made available afterwards. Finally, for those interacting on social media, please use the hashtag Ops for Docs to be part of these conversations. So enough from me for a while and to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rich Ferry. Rich has been Director of UCC Innovation since 2018. Prior to this, he spent the best part of a decade leading the commercialization of IP and technology transfer in the University of Manchester, which is ranked a top three most innovative university in the UK. So over to you, Rich. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, firstly, thank you to uh, Liam and Tara for the invitation to speak today and to you all for uh, registering and being with us today. I was astounded that over 500 people uh, have uh, have joined us, uh, which I think does two things. It shows us the level of interest uh, in this kind of topic now across the nation. And perhaps we're all at this stage of COVID uh, getting a little bit bored with Netflix. So uh, if I could just move on for my first slide, what I wanted to do on there, um, if you could move to the next slide, please, Tara. Uh, what I'm going to do is just explain to you uh, where we work at uh, UCC Innovation. Of course, UCC Innovation is essentially the innovation arm of, of University College Cork. Uh, we're part of the Office of the Vice President for Research and Innovation. And we bring together on the one umbrella four really important aspects of uh, knowledge exchange at the university. The UCC technologies uh, function is essentially our brand for the technology transfer office. And I'll explain a little bit more about how technology transfer is configured uh, across Ireland. Um, and uh, 
Then I'll talk, uh, also I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, UCC Consulting, which my colleague uh, Rachel O'Leary runs. Uh, a number of times in the presentation, I'll be referring to the Ignite uh, Accelerator, which is our flavor of Accelerator program, which aims to look after uh, the individuals who have recently graduated, not just from UCC, but across the nation, who are interested in forming their own startup company. And then I'll also refer to UCC Gateway, which is essentially the uh, real estate function of our office that looks after facilities for startup companies and spin out companies emanating uh, from UCC and beyond. Um, and within that, we also run an accelerator program which is dedicated for spin out activities, which we call Sprint, which is fundamentally important in helping us to accelerate uh, our IP projects, which have spin out potential from the bench to the boardroom. And I guess just to wrap all this up, I'd like to explain that knowledge exchange is roughly defined as the two way interchange between researchers and research users. And it's all about sharing ideas, sharing research evidence and sharing experiences and skills. So it's the it's the wraparound definition for, um, for those kind of activities in a university setting. And the next slide just, just shows the breadth of activities in knowledge exchange that we uh, we undertake at UCC. Now, this is in no way atypical of universities across Ireland. In fact, you'll get um, pretty well each university and third level institution involved in these activities to a certain extent. But it's worth just talking about the uh, the breadth of activities under each one. So under IP uh, management, what we're really about is identifying and protecting IP that emanates from the research activities at the university. Um, trying to uh, prime that intellectual property for downstream commercialization. So that could be via licensing or via spinning out um, and managing the university's patent estate. So importantly, making sure that um, that the integrity of that intellectual property portfolio is maintained, that all the documentation is regularized and that the IP is in a good state to be transferred either to a spin out company or to an independent licensee. Licensing is a hugely important activity in our office. Um, within that, we're essentially uh, transferring IP from the university to either a spin out company or to an independent company uh, for them to commercialize. We're actively marketing our IP to industry and the office that, um, that I'm involved with transacts those IP licenses and then manages them downstream from that, ensuring that we comply with our obligations, ensuring that the licensee also complies with those obligations and making sure that we collect revenue and distribute that to our academic colleagues who were involved in the inventive process. The venturing piece we'll focus on today, so that's all about forming spin out and startup companies. It's about managing the interface between ourselves and our spin out portfolio. By that, I mean uh, attending board meetings, managing the equity aspects, uh, and importantly, providing an input to helping them to scale and grow. It's important for us that we don't just um, form companies, but we also help them to grow because uh, the function that we're involved with is about providing economic benefit uh, to, the, to the country. And so employment um, is a really important uh, flavor of what we're doing there. So that growth is often dependent on investment um, and our spin out manager recently recruited is key to uh, helping those spin out companies uh, get invested in and then to driving their development plans forward. The incubation piece is the real estate bit, but we're now uh, universities there's an, an added flavor there in that the, within the incubator, there's a program called Sprint, which essentially um, uh, provides a systematic experience for academics involved in the spin out process to allow them to get the necessary experience to upskill from be, being a researcher to being a, an entrepreneur and then we have a consultancy activity which supports um, our licensing and spin out activity. And we're also heavily involved with industrial liaison. So we're the primary point of contact for external companies with the university. So you can see there's a huge range uh, of activities involved in knowledge exchange, not just at UCC, uh, but throughout the sector. And on the next slide, what I'm uh, mindful of um, is the breadth of activities a breadth of inquiries that we typically have um, around uh, forming new, new companies. So at the top left there, it's all about individuals who are just inquiring about perhaps how to form a new company. 
And then as you move right, it's a bit more specific. You know, I've got a specific business idea I'd like some support with. Or I think that my research may have some commercial potential. What do I do with that? Or perhaps I'd like to form a spin-out company based on my research. So perhaps a bit more of a, of a, of a, of a statement of intent to get involved and to form a spin-out company. Now, in terms of learning about the basics of forming a company, that's typically handled in our university uh, through, um, through the academic side of the house um, and through uh, the Cork University Business School. Um, in terms of people with a business idea that like some startup support with, the port, the port of call for that would be the Ignite program where there is no intellectual property involved in that. And I'll explain how that works in a moment. Where the research has commercial potential, it's very important that the case managers involved, uh, employed by UCC are made aware of that. So they will work with you to take invention disclosures, to understand the commercial potential of that research and to, to, to really get under, under the bonnet and to work out whether licensing is the best way forward for that uh, technology or perhaps forming a new company. And when individuals do come to us with that stated intention of forming uh, a spin-out company, we very quickly get them onto our sprint programme and try to help them uh, develop their commercial skills alongside our case managers working with them to protect the intellectual property. So moving on, I just want to draw a distinction between startup uh, companies, which um, just as a matter of definition, are companies formed by staff which do not, or all students, which don't involve intellectual property, to spin out companies where the very formation of the company is highly dependent on research ideas and intellectual property uh, from universities. Um, and those two different modes uh, imply a different way of management from our side. So we use a cohort approach, which I'll explain in a minute, to uh, manage startups. But there's a very much more of a one-to-one -one relationship between our spin-out and startup managers uh, and, uh, and the individual researchers. So you can expect, if you uh, are going to go down the spin-out route, to get an intense experience, uh, highly supported uh, by our office. Just turning to startup companies on the next slide for a moment. Um, I've already mentioned that they're not based on university IP. They're relatively common though. Um, and at UCC, we would form about 20 of these companies a year. Although the national statistics, I believe, are pretty well underreported under with respect to startups. I've mentioned that we have a, a cohort approach and uh, as well as accelerators uh, uh, at UCC, they're prevalent uh, across the country. And the Ignite accelerator, which I'll describe on the next slide, is our flavour of that. So Ignite, a 12 month programme, which is open not just to UCC graduates, but to graduates from all over uh, Ireland. It supports founders to turn their innovative ideas into scalable businesses. So a condition of becoming enrolled on Ignite is that you do actually have your own business idea to start with. And we run two cohorts a year, each of which uh, um, accepts 10 applicants. And the stated aim of the program is essentially to get those applicants to a point where they gen uh, they've created a company and they're either generating revenue organically or they're in a position to raise investments. And the program consists of a, a series of workshops, um, some of which are aimed at the specific aspects of uh, business creation and some of which are aimed at developing personal skills that are useful along the journey. And it's very important that um, registrants on the program are supported. And there's an extensive network of entrepreneurs, business owners uh, and industry professionals who get involved with the program and provide advice and guidance. So moving on, uh, by contrast, you'll see the spin out some relatively rare events. And these are the national stats uh, from 2018, which shows that from an input of about 460 million uh, of, uh, of research into the system, 350 invention disclosures resulted, just shy of 100 patents resulted. Um, and out of the whole process, 22 spin outs pop out at the other end. So what you're really saying is for around about every 21 million euro of research, uh, a spin out company arises. That gives you a, a stat and that would certainly um, resonate uh, with UCC where our 100 million uh, of uh, research typically generates about five spin outs on an annual basis. And then if I drill a bit more down into the detail with respect to the spin out process on the next slide, you'll see that there are a variety of ways in which we uh, interact with our academic colleagues and students during this process. So I guess the green box is where I am today, raising awareness about spin out opportunities and trying to evangelize about the whole thing. You know, I'm really passionate about forming new companies. 
the a great experience not only for our academics that provide but they provide employment um, for um, people within the region and provide investment opportunities as well so it's a fantastic um, thing for academics to experience uh, alongside their research um, we have our case managers actively uh, uh, out in the university and the institutes looking for um, research opportunities which could uh, be um, uh, transitioned into new companies and that's an important aspect of what we do and what we try to do there is to prime for commercialization we leave her in confund type um, investment from enterprise island and you'll hear a bit more about that and we work to uh, define a business uh, model build out a business plan and try and re raise investment on the back of that and at the same time as us doing that, um, the, the individual academics are being supported along the sprint program. And so when we're in that business planning phase, we're actively trying to get the spin out over the line, trying to get it to raise investment. Sometimes we'll lever in external um, support through uh, management to complement the academic team where we think that's needed. Uh, and um, the, the objective here is to get a company in place which can scale and grow and become a high performance startup uh, as quickly as possible. And just moving on to the last couple of slides now briefly. Um, this is just to give you a flavour of some of the recent highlights. Um, so uh, you can see in the top left hand corner there just where UCC was ranked in terms of the annual uh, knowledge transfer survey in 2018. Actually there's an inaccuracy there because we were also first on the uh, aggregate number of new patents in that year. And if we look at the number of spin outs acquired recently, I've been absolutely delighted by UCC's performance here and I've just cited three of them there. There's the Luxel uh, acquisition by Agilent, there's the Sensel acquisition by On Semiconductor and both of those acquiring companies uh, have uh, annual revenues in excess of uh, five billion dollars a year. So these are really big companies uh, often from the United States who are seeing fantastic value through acquiring spin-out companies that have uh, arisen from University College Cork. And then if you look at the Knowledge Transfer Impact Awards, we've, we've won a number of these, but I would say nothing gave me greater pleasure than uh, this year's award, or last year's award, I should say more accurately, in 2019, when my colleague Anthony Morrissey won Knowledge Transfer Achiever of the Year, which is highly deserved after years and years of distinguished performance, managing our activities in uh, tech transfer down at the Tyndall Institute, which is a key aspect of what we do. And you'll see that we're also actively involved in consulting with my colleague, Rachel O'Leary, running the uh, UCC consulting program, which is now really beginning to take off and add value not only to our spin outs, but to our licensing. So in summing up on the last slide, what I'd like to do is just to show how uh, tech transfer is organized uh, across the country and Knowledge Transfer Ireland sponsor technology transfer. We have in place um, a national IP protocol, which sets us aside from most countries and defines the standards under which knowledge transfer and technology transfer should be managed across the nation. It defines the playing field, it um, sets standards of professionalism. Um, and I'm delighted that most of my colleagues uh, in the office here at Cork uh, are uh, registered um, RTTP status, so they're registered as technology transfer professionals and have attained the standard uh, that Praxis Oral um, uh, set for that. Um, and if you look at the number of RTT professionals globally, actually 8.4% of them come from Ireland, um, which considering um, Ireland was a fairly late comer to the tech transfer game in 2007, that's a fantastic achievement. So uh, you will find at your university, you will have somebody like me um, who is doing uh, knowledge transfer. Um, they're arranged in consortia. I've um, described the, the lead uh, institution for those consortia and also the other um, the other partner institutions that are involved in those uh, technology transfer endeavours. And with that, a minute or two late, uh, I'll move on to my final slide and just say, if you've got any further questions for me, I'd be more than happy to take them um, on the uh, on the function on Teams here. You've got my mobile number and my email address, uh, and I'd be very happy to talk to anybody who has any questions or inquiries uh, or comments I'd like to make either during this or, or afterwards. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, Liam. That's great. Thanks so much, Rich. So our next presenter is Dr. Claire Walsh, Senior Commercialization Specialist in Enterprise Ireland. Claire com completed her PhD in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, 
followed by research work in the University of Gothenburg. She worked in industry prior to joining Enterprise Ireland. So we just run Claire's video now, please, Tara. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you to Liam and Tara for organising today's session and for including this session on the commercialisation fund. So as Liam mentioned, my name is Claire. I am a commercialisation specialist in our life sciences division, and I will talk you through a basic introduction to our commercialisation fund. So Enterprise Ireland, we are the government agency responsible for the development and growth of Irish companies and startups in world markets. We sit, or I myself and our team, we sit in the research and innovation division. This division supports specifically the research and, research and innovation agenda for EI companies. So our role is to really create connections between companies and academia. Uh, there are a wide number of programmes uh, which we operate that work to this to this objective. The Commercialisation Fund is one of them. So with the Commercialisation Fund, it is slightly different because we are working with researchers, not with companies. Um, but what we are aiming to do is to support these researchers or yourselves to transform any commercially relevant technology into investable startups with the potential to scale and compete in international markets. So in effect, what we are looking to do is to take to help you to take your research out of the lab and into the marketplace. Uh, this work we do very much in partnership with our technical transfer office colleagues. Um, as you're probably all aware, there are te technical transfer offices in most um, most of the research producing organisations, universities, and institutes of technologies across Ireland, um, or they are certainly associated with uh, relevant research centres. So we very much work hand in glove with those teams um, when it comes to the commercialisation fund. So the commercialisation fund is quite unique in that it has a team of 16 commercialisation specialists. Uh, that's all of us there on the left. Uh, my colleagues Dahi and Andrew are missing, um, but basically we're a team of 16. We work across uh, various technology areas, including life sciences, manufacturing, engineering, energy, ICT and food. We, uh, there are commercialization specialists assigned to all of the RPOs across Ireland. So um, if you don't know us, the commercialization, the research offices and the technical transfer offices certainly will, they, and they will be able to facilitate introductions. The role of the commercialization specialist is to really, obviously, commercialization, it's a long, it's a long journey and it's not necessarily a familiar journey for, um, for academic researchers. So our role is to uh, support you from the very beginning. And that, mean, that essentially means we are there to advise you on your application as you craft it. Um, we are also there, uh, our support continues uh, with you once a project begins. And this really, um, this it, it is quite a long-term relationship. Really, you know, we are with you for the, the duration, it can, which can be a couple of years. So, our role really is to help you to realise the commercial potential of your idea and to develop a commercially focused project plan. Obviously, the commercialisation journey is uh, quite risky. So what we often recommend our applicants to do is to engage with our 15,000 euro commercialization uh, feasibility grant. And this is a small grant which we use to initially sense check the commercial opportunity um, around a particular technology or product. So this 15,000 euros can be used to procure independent consultancy services. So you can essentially take that money and um, get um, some market research done, you can get a regulatory pathway outlined, or you can invest it in an IP strategy. And this is all about gathering additional evidence that will support the commercial case um, for your application. So for in most cases, we would, when applicants come to talk to us, we will always usually start with looking at whether or not a feasibility um, could bring some value to your application. 
the larger commercialization fund program. So we have an open call twice a year in February and in July. Um, this, the program itself is like we I mentioned is designed to allow researchers to develop, build and validate technology, both technically, but most importantly, commercially. There are significant monies available for this. We typically would fund anywhere between 100,000 euro and 500,000 euro. And this is over a typical time frame of between two of about two years, but it can sometimes be up to three. Some projects can take longer. Um, in addition to the monies, there is also um, non-financial support um, received through a project. So, as I discussed, the role of the commercialization specialist is really key in supporting you, the applicant, and um, usually um, the, the technical expertise lies with the researchers, whereas it's our job to really support you to build out the commercial expertise on the project. We do that through a number of ways. We have mentor supports that are available to all applicants once their projects begin. We have a very uh, large market research centre in Enterprise Ireland. We have ready access to market reports, to um, a network of um, entrepreneurs and startups in a wide variety of, um, of business, business areas. And we also have a complimentary business partners programme, which my colleague Kevin will speak to um, in the following slide deck. Um, but this can be really effective for building out a, a strategic team that encompasses both the technical and the commercial expertise required to make the project successful. So who should apply to the commercialization fund? As I mentioned, we are funding in the three areas of life sciences, food, ICT and manufacturing and engineering. We are specifically um, looking for postgraduate researchers in Irish universities, Institute of Technologies and Associated Research Centres. We very much welcome um, applications from early career researchers. The, typically, the technologies and product, products that um, come through the commercialisation fund application process um, can often have been developed over a number of years and are quite a sophisticated level of development or have a high TRL technology readiness level. Uh, these, these projects tend to have the technology significantly de-risked and are now ready to pivot towards a commercial application. However, we do look at proof of concept projects as well where the technology is maybe not so well developed um, or it has been developed over a much shorter timeline. Um, but when we look at proof of concept projects, we really need the comfort that there is a strong commercial case evident um, very early on. But absolutely, we we will take a look at all projects. Just to say the commercialization fund can be a really interesting opportunity in terms of alternative career benefits. It is different to some of the other typical research funds in that you do become immersed in a very different uh, ecosystem. Enterprise Ireland, we are a business development agency and you are exposed to a lot of uh, business development events, networks um, and the deliverables um, within the project are fundamentally commercially driven. Um, this will also give you the opportunity to um, hone and improve those skills for yourself, project management, business development, um, marketing, uh, market research, etc. So for those of you who may find that interesting, I would suggest that absolutely the commercialization fund uh, can broaden horizons uh, significantly in that respect. So I think I've just skipped my last slide there, but basically what we were suggesting is these are the recommended next steps. So for any of you who this, for which this presentation might spark your interest, our recommendation is that first and foremost you link in with the technical transfer um, in your network. Uh, the technical transfer officers will help you in the first instance to establish how developed your technology is, have those initial conversations about commercial case feasibility um, and if uh, there is any protectable intellectual property associated with your technology. So it, we, the way we operate at the moment is that um, Talk to your TTOs and they will happily make uh, introductions to us, the commercialization specialists. And then together we can start working with you, the researcher, to build um, to build a path forward on an application process. 
uh, I think that is pretty much all I have to say at this point, but Liam should have all of my details. Um, uh, I probably, I'm not sure how I'll be able to answer questions in the immediate, but um, Liam can take any questions and forward them on to me and be happy to um, come back to you. Thank you so much for your attention. Bye. So thanks very much to Claire for that. Um, I suppose while we're lining up our next presentation, just a quick reminder to keep those questions coming in on the Q&A function. Um, I can see our presenters there working diligently, answering the questions, um, and they have plenty more capacity and, and are delighted to do so. Um, so the other thing actually is the hashtag ops for docs. We should, uh, if you're looking at uh, getting involved in conversations online, please, please use that hashtag ops for docs. Okay, so next up we have Kevin Burke, who is Senior Commercialization Specialist with Enterprise Ireland and Manager of the Business Partners Program. Kevin is expert in working with third level science based spin outs and their founding teams. So over to you, Kevin. Uh, thanks very much, Liam, and it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, online with so many interesting research scientists working in a very interesting multidisciplinary interdisciplinary research centre. And I think there's probably lots of potentially interesting commercial opportunities um, that could be the basis of separate commercialization funding and spin out activity. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the EI Business Partners Program. So. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is a complementary co-founders program. So if we think about, you know, you're a researcher and you're embarking on going from an initial idea all the way through to developing a product, establishing the commercial opportunity, validating the customer need and making all of that investable so that additional finance can come in later on. You're going to need help from a range of different people along the way. So you're going to perhaps need some technical help from other people. You might need mentors and um, you might need to access regulatory consultants, commercialization consultants and so on. But somewhere along the way, if you are beginning to make good progress on developing the product or the minimum viable prototype, and you're beginning to think that this could be the basis of a spin out opportunity, but maybe you don't have a lot of commercial experience yourself, um, or you feel that you could do with a, a blend of skills within your founding team, then the business partners program is a good complementary uh, assistance to that. Because the whole idea is that we blend uh, the technical and research capabilities of researchers working on a spin out idea and a spin out project with people who have good commercial experience already who've been there, done that, they've raised investment, they've been involved in their own spin out or startup, um, and they've grown and scaled a company. Um, so next slide, please. Because um, you can initiate a project, a ComFund project, with a certain blend of skills in your project, but over time, the, the, the mixture of skills you're going to need to take that idea further into an investable, credible, scalable company, it's going to change as time moves on. So ultimately, investors and so on are looking to see that blend of skills in the team. And research scientists working on spin out projects, sometimes they have maybe a limited network. They're very networked with people maybe who have very similar skills and outlooks to themselves. Um, but maybe they don't have that other kind of blend of other kinds of skill sets because maybe their network doesn't extend that far. So uh, next slide, please. So what we do is we provide a way to effectively extend your network into those kinds of people. So we've now got a network of these people ourselves. So we identify, we screen, we interview, and then we onboard those people with that background, with those commercial fundraising investment skills. And we then have a panel and effectively we're continually trying to match those people with spin out projects at the correct time 
when that support is needed and when the people in that project team um, acknowledge and realize that if we're going to make this happen, we're going to need someone extra to join the team. And I'll explain why that is as well in a minute. But basically, the idea is that by finding somebody and bringing somebody in, you get uh, you create a much better division of labor. So now we've got two people, perhaps and sometimes even three, but generally maybe two founders from the Institute or the research center or maybe one and a business partner. We can now divide up the labor so that we can be much more productive so that we can move at speed, which is really the advantage of a spin out or a startup company versus large corporates who might be the incumbents is that how quickly you can move. So by creating a better division of labor, you can actually move much faster and execute on your plan much quicker. So that division of labor means that investors have a higher level of confidence around the team's ability to execute. It also means that the people in the project team can now play in the best position on the founding team. So they're going to be maybe very focused on the things they're really good at. Um, and that also gives us an additional advantage that we already are playing on. Um, and also, if you're in a spin out and it's your first time and you haven't been involved in commercialization before, it can really help to have somebody experienced along with you because they've maybe made a lot of mistakes themselves already and your spin out is going to get the benefit of that hard won experiential knowledge so that you can avoid some of those pitfalls yourself as you spin out. So because getting involved in a spin out is a risky endeavor. So if you're going to do it, you want to mitigate all the risks that are there as much as you can. And having somebody experienced who's been along this path before should give you additional confidence that this is worth a try. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the way it works and it's quite simple. So you do need to be working on a project already and one that's maybe making progress. Maybe you've built a minimum viable prototype. Maybe it's being tested and trialed with some potential customers or trial partners or whatever. Um, because to attract a business partner in the first place, they're going to want to see that there's something kind of happening already, you know, that there's something interesting there. So for very, very early stage ideas, a business partner is probably not where you're going to start. You're going to start with a feasibility study and a commercialization consultant. But if you're further on and you've made more progress than that, a business partner could be the exact right support for you if you're open to it. So we will, you, you start your conversation with your TTO or your EI commercialization specialist. Um, we'll then set up some Zoom calls. We'll go through some of the people we have on the panel. We'll organize direct Zoom or team calls with those people. You can then start to get a feel for the chemistry that there might be there. Uh, with that other person because that's hugely important in a startup company, but also the competence and the value add that they could or will bring. So um, so you want to see that the complementarity is there and the chemistry is there. And effectively, the business partners program provides a framework and a structure for that trial phase to happen. So we'll give three to six months months funding to the business partner to start to collaboratively work with the team under an MOU and with the support of the tech transfer office. And that effectively is to test whether this is going to work or not. Is it working now? Can we see that this could work into the future as co-founders? If it's not working, and it, in many cases it doesn't for different reasons, we just pause and bring the engagement to a conclusion. There is no fault on either side. It's an experiment to see if we can find the right people to work together in a spin out founding team. We pay the business partner separately to your commercialization fund budget. Um, and ideally, the scenario we're talking about is during the comp fund when there's a, a certain amount of comp fund runway still in place because it's beneficial to have a business partner onboarded and working with you when the team are still fully resourced and focused on, an on, a, on a spin out objective, because now we can influence how we allocate resources and where we point the technology to. And sometimes pivots that happen late in projects can be the difference between a very successful spin out and a spin out that just doesn't quite get off the ground. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what do we look for in a business partner? Well, we're, we're looking for previous commercial track record and we screen for that and we test for that. We're also looking for people who have a can-do attitude and are action orientated because in a startup and a spin out, you need to be making decisions and you need to be making things happen. Um, and we, we select for people that we feel have the correct attitude to working collaboratively with research scientists on a spin out idea. So we're trying to create a relationship of equals here. Uh, we're trying to create a peer relationship where the technical founders and the commercial co-founder are each bringing significant value collectively. Um, and we're, we're also looking to see that ideally that person has previous founding and fundraising experience. If they don't have that and they're coming from a corporate background, and that can be important in certain sectors as well, uh, we want to see that they can operate and change and switch altitudes so that they, they know that in a startup there's very little or no external resources. You know, you're trying to create value from very little resources. So we don't select people who require a big team and a whole bunch of resources around them. Um, and also they need to have survival funds for at least 12 months. Um, we will pay them a certain amount, but they need to be able to con continue to work on the spin out opportunity when there's no additional funding coming from us, because it may take a while from when they start working on the project to the point where this is now investable and a seed round is now going to close. So we have to know that they can stick through that longer journey, that hiatus that sometimes happens when the comp fund is finished, the company has spun out, but we still haven't closed or identified our next finance. Uh, next, please. So what do we ask of them? Well, we want them, A, when they come onto the panel, to invest time and effort to find the correct project in the first place. So there is a certain search effort required, but also we want to know that once they find a project that they are going to be able to spend face time uh, with the founding team so that they can immerse themselves in the project and with the team, because that's the only way we're going to know how we get on together and whether we're each adding value in the correct way. We also want them to be staying fully on board through the fundraising process and through subsequent funding rounds because investors invest in teams. So we're, we're not looking for somebody who's going to help the team and then leave because the gap is still there then afterwards and that may make the opportunity uninvestable. So they have to stick with it through the investment period and through fundraising. Um, and we're obviously hoping that they will bring certain network or other uh, connections to the project by coming on board. Next slide, please. Thanks, Liam. Um, yeah, so they're going to work with the team perhaps to do some additional customer validation. They may look at business model design or redesign. They may be looking at pivots, but they're going to come in with fresh eyes and look to do a significant amount of new validation that builds on what's gone before. Um, and ultimately, um, we want them to look at what is the best possible way in collaboration with the technical founders to bring this forward. Uh, next slide, please. So that means you know, some of those things around we need to now agree mutual roles, responsibilities, time commitment and equity distribution within this emerging spin out company. And the reason we need to do that is because we need to present something that's going to be investable to external investors, because that's probably where our next finance, our next funding is coming from. The business partner will also complete an investor ready business plan as a function of their engagement. Um, and assuming that it's going correctly and that everyone is now decided we're going to co-found together, they will be part of the team that will be negotiating the intellectual property license and the shareholder agreement with, for example, with Rich and his team in the technology transfer uh, office. Uh, next slide, please. This is a snapshot of some of the spin outs that have been created through the program to date. The program's been running for about eight or nine years. Uh, last year, we had five HPSUs um, funded where the business partner was the commercial co-founder uh, in the founding team. And I think what I would like to say is that in every single case here, um, there was a researcher 
trying to figure out how do I make this work? How do I progress this? And in each of those cases, a commercial co-founder was brought in through the business partner program and they elevated the commercial direction and momentum of that project in a way that made it investable to investors and other third parties and customers and distributors and channel partners. So what I would say is if you're trying to figure out how do I de-risk and accelerate my plans to be part of a spin-out company, you should consider the business partner program as one way of identifying a person who will go on the journey with you and somebody who is going to de-risk the project on a number of different dimensions, particularly with investors who after all are not sentimental about spin outs or any other kind of project. They want to see that the team have the skills to execute and that they will generate a return on their initial investment into the company. Uh, last slide, please, I think, or one of the last ones. There are two case studies currently written up. Uh, one is Audio Sorcery, which is a, a Cork Institute of Technology spin out company. And uh, the second is Synoptica Technologies, which is a TCD uh, spin out company. And in both those cases, there was one postdoctoral research uh, co founder involved, and they and the business partner worked to get together to close an investment round and to scale and progress the company accordingly. I think I could be on my last slide at this point. So uh, I'll continue to try and answer questions uh, through the live Q&A um, and uh, I will let, uh, I'll put the microphone back on to Liam. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much, Kevin. So while Tara is lining up our next piece, um, which is a conversation with Fiona Edwards Murphy, um, just to say that I can see there's a lot of activity now on the Q&A and um, Kevin and Rich um, will have a few to publish, so they'll be working diligently on that for the next while. Um, brilliant to see that everybody is staying online um, with us, up around 300 still online, so that's that's really positive and, uh, and once again, thanks everybody for that. Just a reminder on the hashtag ops for docs, if you're on social media, just so we can be all part of that conversation. Um, and um, so now we'll move back over to Tara, hopefully, who will be showing us the final video, which is about 14, 15 minutes long um, with uh, Fiona edwards Warfi. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be joined in conversation now by Dr. Fiona Edwards Murphy, co-founder and CEO of Apris Protect, one of the most exciting tech startups in Ireland right now. So thank you, Fiona, for making the time to join us. Uh, thanks so much, Liam. It's, it's great to it's great to be on. Excellent. So, so I suppose, Fiona. So both you and Apris Protect have been making waves as such over a number of years now and have had a lot of success and we get a chance to talk about that. But maybe first of all, can I bring you right back and ask you about your first interest in engineering as a young girl? Oh, OK, um, sure. Yeah, um, I guess I think I've always been interested in engineering to a certain extent. Um, I've always been um, very interested in how the world around me works. I mean, like my my um, my subjects that I was really good at in school were always like maths. And uh, you know, when I went to secondary school, I was lucky enough to go to a school where we had subjects like tech drawing and engineering and construction studies. So I mean, like I was I was really exposed to the world of engineering. And uh, my dad is a technician or was a technician in Aircom. And um, so he he brought me in a couple of times when I was very small to like telephone exchanges and stuff like that. So I think it was just kind of being surrounded by technology and really seeing um, what what engineering was like from an early age, I think was was something that really pushed me in that direction. And uh, that's why uh, when I did my leave insert, my first choice and actually I, I, I filled out, you know, all the CEO options, but it was like nah, electrical engineering at UCC. That's the only one I really want to do. So I put a number one and kind of didn't really think I can't even remember what other things I had on my list. So I was lucky that I, I got that one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, I think it's kind of it's always been the obvious thing that I was going to do. <laughs> Very good. So, so you went down, you just mentioned you went on to do engineering in UCC subsequently. And 
What attracted you then ultimately to pursue a PhD? Yeah, um, so I think, um, well, one thing that I was really lucky um, was during during my um, studies at UCC, I had a, a, a scholarship. So it was an SFI and Dell sponsored scholarship for um, uh, women in engineering. And as part of that, um, they actually funded an internship with um, any research group that you were interested in, in it within the college. Um, so that's when I, I did an internship with the Embedded Systems Group um, in, in Elekenj at UCC, so with Emmanuel there, and um, I, I had a great time. So that was when I was in my second year. So that was quite quite early on, I guess, I got an opportunity to, to do that um, that internship and get to see what, what being part of a research group was like and learn about, you know, all the parts of um, academia, like, you know, publishing papers and stuff like that, which was um, kind of, that was all new to me at that stage, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I did my, my, my third year, um, internship was again, it was another internship with a research group. So I went over to the University of Notre Dame uh, and did a, 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 an internship there on nanomagnetic logic. So that was that was really interesting as well. And I think by the time I was finished with that, I spent enough time in labs to go. Yeah, no, this is really interesting. This is for me. Um, and I did when I was finishing up in, in fourth year, I uh, approached Emmanuel and I said, I, I really want to do I want to keep, I want to stay on here. Um, and I started out uh, initially only um, thinking that I was going to do a master's, like a master's by research. And um, like two or three months in, it was like, no, no, get that, get that, uh, get that um, IRC application out. I want to stay here for the full <laughs> four years. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And, and obviously then you went and you completed your PhD. And maybe when did, when did you start thinking about entrepreneurship then as, a, as an option? Yeah, that was um, that was kind of again. I guess <laughs> kind of my entire life I've been making kind of like big decisions to go in different directions. It's like, okay, no way, I want a job. I'm going doing a PhD, and then uh, when I was finishing the PhD again, it was like, nope, definitely going to go start my own business. Uh, but I think what what really um, uh, helped me see that um, the opportunity around starting my own business, I think, was really the fact that I was working on um, in a space that had um, clear kind of real world practice practical applications. So um, when I was working on, so I, my PhD was on um, um, wireless sensor network technologies for Honeybee Health. And as part of that, I got an opportunity to talk an awful lot to beekeepers and to understand, you know, what kind of, what kind of problems that they were experiencing were, um, you know, where they saw a need for technology in, in their own operations. And I think that that's probably one of the really key things about entrepreneurship is um, it kind of becomes a really obvious thing to do when you have a problem that you think you can solve. So I think that that's something that that really helped me um, make that transition. It was uh, speaking to the people who ultimately ended up becoming my customers. It was like um, I was there working on the sensor technology. I wasn't thinking about it as anything other than a tool for science. And um, then beekeepers just kept going, oh yeah, could I buy one of those off you? And I was like, no. And I was like, oh, I guess maybe I should try doing that. So it was really talking to the beekeepers um, that really made me realize I, I was um, that there was an opportunity out there to create a technology for them. OK, so so really you started to ask my next, you start to answer my next question here probably. <laughs> way. So you, you had, there was a problem there that needed to be solved. Yeah. The beekeep, beep, beekeepers had that problem. And I suppose my next mm -hmm. question was how, how then did Apis Protect start as a business? What was, what were those initial, um, initial things you needed to do to, to, to move it into being a business as such? Yeah, I think, yeah, exactly what I was just saying there. I think really that the, the key thing that decides whether or not, um, you know, a technology is something that that should be brought into the commercial world is is it is it solving a real problem. Is there a real problem out there that this will fix? And I think that that's, that's really the first thing that we set out to, to understand that APIS Protect. It was really, um, OK, well, we know that um, sensor technology can do an awful lot of cool things for beekeepers, but what are the things that beekeepers actually struggle with that um, technology can help them address? And one thing that I did that really helped um, help me on that journey and understanding exactly, you know, how like there's loads of like techniques and stuff like that to actually analyze problems and understand um, you know, product market fit and customer needs and stuff like that. It was joining the um, the Ignite program at UCC. So um, I joined that just as I was finishing up my PhD and we spent, I think it's a good, a good nine months that you're on that program and they take you through everything uh, from, you know, all the way through from you go in there with just kind of like an idea. And my idea was, I think beekeepers could use this. 
and uh, they help you through all the steps of understanding, okay, what's the problem? What's the value of the problem? Okay, what's the product to solve that problem? And does the price of the product fit with the, the value of the problem and the value of fixing the problem all the way through to understanding things like accounting and, you know, the legal parts of setting up a business and, you know, um, having employees and um, marketing and sales and all these things that as someone who coming out of academia, um, all of that stuff was completely terrifying to me, but that, that was a really great way to kind of um, get get my feet on the ground in those departments, you know. Absolutely, and these structured programs are so valuable, I think, aren't they, for um, for people like you who are, who are at that point in development with the business. So yeah. maybe tell us a little bit now about APIS Protect, what it is you do, you know, you've won so many different accolades, you personally and, and the business, you've had so much success over the last, you know, I suppose two or three years in particular. Talk to us a little bit about Apes Protect. Yeah, sure. So um, what we do um, at Apes Protect fundamentally is we um, help safeguard one third of the food that we eat every day. Uh, so a whole host of foods that we eat, things like almonds, avocados, apples, blueberries and cranberries are given to us by a bee pollination. And specifically, the honeybee is the only bee that we have that we can manage at an, at an industrial scale. So um, honeybees all around the world are used uh, as part of um, the agri agriculture industry in order to uh, pollinate those kind of crops. And um, the, the reason why there's, a, there's an opportunity for us here is that um, bees have been experiencing health problems. And I think everybody knows about that. Everybody's seen the headlines. Uh, there's diseases, there's pests, there's predators, things like giant hornets and stuff like that, um, that are killing bees all throughout the world. And beekeepers now are losing up to half of their honeybees every single year. Um, so there's a huge, well, well, there's a massive new opportunity for beekeepers to add uh, this pollination industry on top of their existing honey markets. And they're really struggling at the moment because just finding enough bees and just um, keeping their bees alive enough to take advantage of those opportunities is, is a struggle for them. So what we do at Apis Protect is we have a, a sensor technology so a teeny tiny sensor, I actually happen to have one of them here, which I usually forget to have nearby. <laughs> um, and um, that goes inside the beehive. It fits uh, within existing beehives, so it's retrofitted into existing beekeeping operations. And um, we collect sensor data, so temperature, humidity, sound, movement, things like that. And we use machine learning to actually translate that from raw data, which the beekeeper doesn't really care about, into useful information at the bee colonies. So things like, OK, that colony over there actually died. Um, this one over here needs to be fed. Um, this one is shrinking, but we think it should be growing. So you need to you know, apply a treatment or something like that. And that's really that. I think that that step beyond um, the kind of academic stuff that that's out there is really one, it's the really valuable thing that we do at Apes Protect, telling the beekeeper what they want to know, not what we think is interesting. It, that Those are the kind of steps that I think was really important as part of the entrepreneurship process. So it's understanding what the customer needs more so than, than what, what kind of fun things you'd like to do. Um, so that's what we do at Apes Protect. We, we solve the really simple problems that are killing um, millions of beehives across the world every year. Okay. And maybe some of the successes you've had, where, where are you operating now? I know you're managing bees all over the world. Yeah, yeah sorry, I always forget to mention that stuff. So yeah, um, we're, we've got um, technology on uh, three continents. So we've got uh, an awful lot of beehives in the USA. We've got uh, as well some here in Ireland, some in the UK and some in South Africa. So we've got bees on three continents. Uh, we're now monitoring 20 million honeybees across all of those regions. Uh, we've got a, a really fantastic database of bee information. Um, one of the really exciting things from, from an academic point of view is we've seen um, a whole host of different bee subspecies and different uh, beekeeping climates. So we've kept bees, we've seen bees uh, kept up in the mountains uh, that are under snow for the majority of the year, all the way down to beehives in the desert and the Arizona desert and beehives in South Africa that have been you know, knocked over by um, you know animals in game reserves and stuff like that. So it's been a really fantastic journey just seeing all of that data coming in from around the globe. Fantastic. And maybe just to looking forward, what does the future hold for APIS Protect? What are your plans for the future? Yeah, so the, the focus for us for the last couple of years, so we were founded in 2017, and the focus for the first three years was really around the, the product development. So getting that database, because it's a machine learning based product, we need a really good database 
to, to train that to train those models and make sure they're very accurate. Um, we've also been working with a lot of academic beekeepers to help us um, train those models to help us understand what beekeepers really need. Um, how can we physically like getting the product that small physically from an engineering point of view was another big challenge. And um, it was really getting the product perfect. And now we're at the stage where we're going to be we're going to have our first um, major customers in, in 2020. So we're going to be rolling them out. COVID-19 is not stopping us. And um, uh, the next couple of years, it's going to be all about scaling. So scaling is, is the, the really exciting part, um, getting uh, beekeepers um, in as many parts of the world as we can engaged in, in our technology, get them on board and get their get that technology rolled out across their, their large operations um, is going to be really exciting. Great. So my final question, Fiona, for you is, um, and we have a lot of people tuned in right now who are thinking about maybe starting a business. And my question really um, for them to you is, what advice would you give to people thinking about starting a business? Sure. Um, so I think um, there's probably loads of things, but um, first of all, I think it's, it's take advantage of the, the network that's out there. Um, uh, all over Ireland, we've got a fantastic um, entrepreneurship kind of ecosystem between um, uh, all of the universities, um, Enterprise Ireland, local enterprise offices, um, other people as well. Um, I, if I start listing them, I'll just go on forever. Um, no matter where you are in the country, and especially here in Cork, we've got a, a really great network and um, there's so many people there who will be happy to just have a coffee with you and talk about um, whatever it is that they know about and how it can help you. Um, people are always really excited to, to hear about new ideas and um, suggest um, suggest more ideas and stuff like that. So really, it's don't don't keep it inside. You start start talking to people about it, and really, when you start talking to people about your idea, that's when it really starts to develop and it starts to grow because all of that feedback, even if it's feedback that you end up going, no, that that was definitely not a good idea. You get better at understanding why what you have is a good idea. Um, and then I think it's as well, you know, take advantage of those networks, um, get involved and um, start talking to everyone that you can possibly find and ask them for introductions. Everybody is always, uh, everybody always shocks me with how open and happy to make introductions they are. Okay. Listen, Fiona, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, thanks for making the time for us and I wish you every success into the future, personally and with Apis Protect. No problem. Thanks so much, Liam. And, uh, Good luck to everybody who's about to start on their entrepreneurship experience. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks very much. Bye. So um, thank you to Fiona for, for doing that um, conversation with me uh, yesterday. I know Fiona is is on the, on the um, call now as well. So thank you, Fiona. Um, and at this point, really, I know we've gone a few minutes over and my apologies for that. Um, but really just to, to thank everybody for logging on for our webinar today. Um, we're delighted with the response and we hope you found the session useful. Uh, if, if I maybe could ask you to do one thing after this session, it's to make contact with the technology transfer offices in your own institutions to explore your ideas and the supports available to you. They are ready to help. Um, a full listing of all Irish technology transfer offices with contacts is available on knowledgetransferireland.com. Uh, the email addresses of our presenters should be on screen shortly. Uh, if you would like to contact them directly to look, or maybe we'll also look at circulating some information um, after this event in the coming days, including a link to the video of this session. Uh, thanks to our speakers, Rich, Claire, Kevin and Fiona. And a very special word of thanks to the lady behind the scenes, my Marai colleague, Tara Reddington. Uh, who has done an incredible job in pulling all of this together and also a special word of thanks to our UCC IT colleague Christopher McGilligat who also supported us um, in the last number of days. So I suppose bye for now. Uh, thank you again on behalf of all at the Science Foundation Ireland Marai Centre and all at Enterprise Ireland. Bye bye.